Hello, everyone, and welcome to a recording of Bits and Bytes CEO Insights. And today we are joined by Mark Schilling, founder and CEO of Schilling IT out of Valparaiso, Indiana, which is just outside of Chicago, I just found out. <laughs> Chris Olson, IT director of Catalyst IT out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And Greg Bebo, founder of and CEO of Terminal B out of Austin, Texas. And today we are going to be discussing top action items a company owner can do right now to tighten up your security position. How are you all doing today, gentlemen? Doing good. Very Wonderful. good. Thanks. Excited to talk about this today. Uh, I think we all hear first and foremost, security, 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 be it cybersecurity, data security, but security is on the tip of the tongue of everybody and top of the mind. So I'm excited to... Uh, get into y'all's heads and your minds and have y'all share some advice for company owners of all sizes, those just getting started, those on, on the upward tick and those mature firms already. So just starting at the top here, uh, let's start with uh, just foundational security measures. You know, what are, what are some foundational, you got to do security measures that every company should have in place to protect their business as well as their data? Who wants to jump in here? Yeah, Greg, I'm going to start. All right, we'll go with Mark. Mark, Mark, yeah, Mark, I can hit the, Mark, hit the, Mark hit the buzzer first. All right, Mark. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I think if we want to get with just starting with basics, uh, a big thing that we continue to come across when, we're, when we talk with businesses is just like good login hygiene, uh, right? Some like the just like one on one with like password management. How are you controlling your passwords? Are you reusing your passwords just over and over and over again? Um, you know, it's, it seems to still be a very bad practice that people use. Um, you, we can scan a web browser and extract passwords out and see that somebody, we had actually, we just did this the other day. We had somebody had 245 times use the same password with some different web portals. Oh um, that's yeah. not a good situation. <laughs> yeah. If your password gets stolen um, and then they find out where you're going, um, you're wide open to the, everything um, that you have access to. So... You know, putting in a policy that would say, hey, every password should be different, using a tool like a password manager. Uh, I know people are starting to use those more, even personally in their lives, uh, being able to manage those passwords in an encrypted vault that uh, can't be easily stolen out of a web browser because people think, oh, hey, save the password in the web browser. You get that prompt right. Um, that's not safe. So I think that's a, a thing that people are unaware of. They just say, oh, my web browser is asking, but it's not a safe practice. So just being able to be educated on how to properly uh, manage your passwords, uh, making sure MFA is enabled with that, where anywhere possible you have access to a web portal. Some people don't realize that it's available because some Mark, systems don't. If, prop if, you, if you can, uh, talk about what M MFA stands yeah. for, what it is, so that people understand. Some Someone sure. might not. You never know. I'm shocked absolutely. that they don't, actually. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. We still get that from time to time. So it's multi-factor multi authentication, which basically means there's a, two different authentications of getting you into a system. One would be your password to get you in, and then a second authentication, multi, meaning multi, um, which would be like what people would typically get a, you know, a text sent to their phone or an app on their phone that would give them a six-digit code that they could put in to also authenticate their login into a system. And so, you know, that's something that we are constantly preaching to people because of right lack of awareness. They don't realize, oh, I can do that. Some systems force it and demand it, but there's a lot of systems out there that, oh, if I just go into my user settings and then my login, like, oh, there's this option I can turn on this multi-factor authentication because the system's not prompting me, but it would help at least get some quicker securing best practices in place for uh, protecting their logins. It's a great point. Does anyone want to add on that? Because, yeah, I, I'm shocked at how many people don't have that set up. It's one of the easier and most impactful things that somebody can do right away, be it social, email, and also some other applications. Does anyone want to add on top of that? Because I think a lot of times people think MFA is just for email, but I think it ex you know goes further than that. Greg, right. Chris, anyone? Well, I would add that it's it, having it in place um, some of the time is not sufficient. Um, we've yesterday was the third time in 2023 that I had a conversation with someone about a breach where 
not every email account in the organization had MFA turned on. Um, and what ended up happening was bad threat actors got into the accounts on the systems that did not have 2FA enabled, and they lay in wait to find out who gets paid when, who are the, uh, the, what is the org chart, how does decision-making work, all of these things, and all three of them resulted in breaches. Um, and so um, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. So um, if you're going to put on uh, 2FA or MFA, it has to be for everyone that's on your domain, and that would include contractors that may just only have an email account. Those are probably some of the most vulnerable in, in an environment. Very good. Chris, do you want anything to add on, uh, you know, in this area here? Yeah, I'm going to piggyback uh, on the point about everybody and contractors and kind of pivot into a different angle when it comes to foundational security measures. Um, I'm really a big advocate when it comes to security access controls based upon role, um, especially when we're talking about small businesses. I mean, we all understand, we all remember like day one, you just, you grind, right? And just everybody does everything. Everyone has the same hat. Um, even at the small all the way up to the bigger companies is that um, focusing on making sure that people have access to do their job, right? Don't impede people from doing their job, but understand exactly what it takes to do their job and cap it there. Um, so a lot of times we'll come and talk to small businesses who have not th thought about security and everybody has access to everything. Um, or everybody is an administrator, um, you know, uh, a janitor has the exact same access as, you know, the owner. And it's just because that was the easy route to go. Um, the big thing for me is that security and convenience just do not go hand in hand. Um, and you have to embrace that and it just take a moment, recognize that that is critical to you to be able to set up your posture, to be in a better position. And at the end of the day, even on the MFA, a lot of times when we talk to people about MFA, I think we can all attest to this is that people go, oh, well, it's inconvenient because I got to get my code. And, but really I look at it, it's far more inconvenient to have to rebuild your business because someone got in there. I mean, right. brushing your teeth isn't convenient, but you got to do it. Right? <laughs> yeah. and, 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 right. Doing MFA right. is way less inconvenient than t brushing your teeth a couple it, of times it, a day, it, right? Kind of on that thread, I would say, uh, come from long-term partner of ours, uh, talk about security, um, is that they gave the great analogy is that um, it's it's like going to the dentist. You can choose your own adventure. Ultimately, you're going to end up there. It's either it's going to be real painful and expensive and you're going to hate it, or you can do the work and it may be a little more frustrating. You have a few, few more stops and you got to do a few more appointments, but at the end of the day, you're not as angry at the end of the uh, when you end up there. So, so Chris, I'd like to uh, follow up with you on you know you mentioned different levels, you yeah. know setting up different for you, Mark and Greg, y'all y'all didn't even think about what needs to happen to make that happen. But I don't think everybody understands. Well, that that sounds great. Like, how do I stop getting the janitor to have the same level of access sure. as me? Right? How how does one go about that? I think that the first place to start, and there's a lot of different avenues. This is kind of, unfortunately, choose your own adventure because it depends upon your different business here. I would start with identifying roles, right? Really understand exactly what it takes for someone to be successful in their job. Um, and that can be really challenging at, you know, the small business level is because it's everyone's contributing there. But really break that down into base. If you were to lay out a chart and say that, um, you know, you have employee A, B, and C, and their job is explicitly this, this, and this, and they do here and they do here. That's where you can then start to see, well, these people do not need to be having access to this environment. And this person doesn't need to be able to do this. And their role is at this level. While this person's role is over here when it comes to like technical responsibilities or duties, that's when you're going to have to assess that. So a common issue is, is that especially businesses, when you're on the onset, and you're in that, you know, just kind of muscle and feel phase is that you're just going and you're not stopping and thinking about it after the fact. You just built it and now it's way out of control. So I think just taking a moment, recognizing that that's something that has to be done at some point in time for you to grow healthily, um, go through that exercise, map that all out. Um, and at a base level, when it comes to security controls, one big thing, and if I'm stealing points from someone else that they're going to go out there, removing administrative rights. Uh, this is a common thing when we're talking about kind of a crossover of who has access to what is a lot of people just end up having access to everything. Um, that's not necessary. <laughs> if you are, if that is not what your job is, then that's something that you don't need to do. 
Um, and, and by putting in those security controls, you can really help yourself out in the long run. Thank you for that, Chris. I know there's a lot of people right now just saying, hmm, is that how I'm set up? They don't, might not even have ever thought about that. So that, right. that that's a great point for, for people to go back and look. Uh, before I ask a follow-up question on some higher level security measures that you know a mature or larger company can take, does anyone want to add anything there? Uh, yeah, I'd like to add the other, to tie into that is also just knowing the assets, right? Because asset control is just as important because if there's got rogue assets, and when I say asset, I mean like a computer, a device that's connected to the network. Um, if you don't have good inventory of your assets, um, and a, a process to f make sure you're tracking those appropriately, you could have one machine that might have admin rights, as exactly what Chris had said. Maybe there's this one machine that was left open with full admin rights on a machine level. Any, anybody that log in can get in with admin rights, um, still put you at risk. Um, so you could still have that one or two devices on the network um, that could still be problematic from a security perspective. So it's just as important to be make sure you're managing your assets as much as we are managing the security permissions for the users. Yep, and and pruning accounts, uh, making sure that there's a process to make sure that accounts aren't left um, uh, unpruned after people leave. So revisiting every so often is, is contributes to that good hygiene. Excellent, thank you, gentlemen. Now to um, follow up on myself, and what, what, what about when I'm a little bit more mature firm? They want they want to really tighten things up. We talked a, uh, you know, a lot about some of the starting points, some basic things. And again, I'm going to say it again, get MFA installed, get it implemented and integrated. Do it. Do it right now. Do it across social, email, everything. But higher level, uh, higher level tools, you know, there's a mature firm that are thinking about it. What, 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 what are some suggestions that you all have to next level security? The thing that we're actually, that we work on uh, in that perspective is, doing with the penetration test, uh, recurring penetration tests. So working with an outside firm that maybe wouldn't be us that can come in and do a security assessment to basically just say, is there, can we find vulnerabilities on your network that, because, hey, your, your IT provider is doing a good job, but as we know, this landscape's always changing with the cyber threats. And so there's always new things evolving. And to stay on top of that, working with a company that's, proactive, staying on top of what's going on out with the latest threats and could come in and, and basically ex try to expose vulnerabilities to patch those vulnerabilities up outside of what might already be, you know, in place, having good practices in place with patching your systems, locking down accounts, doing different types of audits and logging of systems to, to ensure like best practices are in place with for cybersecurity. Um, but yeah, having out a third party come out and and do recurring audits um, to just say, hey, how are we doing and how can we be better? Because there's always areas for improvement. Excellent. Anyone else want to add on that? Yeah, I would, I would piggyback um, on the penetration test and uh, kind of differentiate between two things there because um, everything that Mark said was fantastic. And one thing to call out a lot of pe people and businesses don't, know is that there's a distinction between vulnerability testing and then penetration testing as well. And one of the things I really advocate at the higher maturity level is continual vulnerability testing um, is on that exact thread that Mark was talking about is um, when they do a penetration test, they're going to identify a point in time and things that need to be addressed at that and uh, ways that uh, like uh, attack vectors that people can get in while well, vulnerability uh, assessment and having, there's a lot of products out there that can do continual assessment of that. They'll report back when there are found vulnerabilities and give you a path to be able to patch those proactively. Um, and so I think that that's a really great item to add into your arsenal when you're really getting into the high tuning level um, as a business that's getting up there. Excellent. Thank thank you all. Greg, do you have any, any uh, final thoughts here in and around Higher level I'm, I'm going to go in the I'm going to go the other direction um, a, a little bit here because I think that although it typically is introduced at a smaller level, it's taken for granted at the higher level, and that is just basic training with your staff on how to use their computers. Um, you know, safe's only as uh, secure um, if you're unable to coerce the people that can let you in, and so we find that you know Outlook for for example is a safe space. Most people consider that a, spa a safe space, but there's 
I think I read once there was six things that can be requested of them that's gonna that they're gonna jump to and um, and take actions they might otherwise not take. There's a myriad of ways that you can um, understand kind of how the technology how technology works, when you should respond, when you shouldn't respond, when you pick up the phone. And I don't think that companies do a really good job of defining that. They very often will rely on the technology to do it for them. Um, and technology can do a lot of those things, but again, technology is not supposed to you know lock everything down so tight that work can't be conducted. Um, and that opening is what allows threat actors to coerce people by, you know, telling them their help is needed, impersonating someone, you know, whatever it may be. And so, um, so incorporating some kind of training, whether it's you know security awareness training, there may be uh, training specific to the company. Um, whatever it may be, and also revisit that because threats are changing constantly. Um, nobody wants to, uh, no business owner or uh, executive wants to read about their firm in the news um, as it pertains to a breach. And so I can't stress that enough. And it kind of falls by the wayside, you know, just as a subscription service or people log in, but it really needs to be enforced if, if it's going to, if the firm's going to benefit from that. Well, can you touch on that last point a little bit more, Greg, about uh, where they can get or, you know, have their employees go find training for stuff like this? What would um, you there are quite a few. Um, a quick Google will, uh, we include it in our services for free, but uh, a quick Google search will lead, you know, any security awareness training programs that may exist. Um, okay. the, good, the good ones will allow you to actually track. Um, and assign and make minimum scores and stuff of that nature. Um, that's on the, you know, for firms that want to be more hands-on, but the exposure itself is is so paramount to making sure everybody's on the same page of what's risky behavior when you use your computer. Fair enough. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, now, something that I come across often is a lot of confusion or, you know, a lot of unknown around antivirus versus the next level of EDR. Uh, a lot of people think, because it's been trained, you know, pounded in our head ever since the internet, antivirus, antivirus, antivirus. I uh, would love for one of y'all to jump in and talk about the differences between antivirus and the new gen antivirus, which is EDR, and how much better it can be and how much, I guess, antivirus on steroids-esque that it is. Who wants to hop in here? I'm going to go uh, back to you. Uh, oh, Chris hit the buzzer first this time. Go ahead. Sure, <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll add in a little bit. Um, and I think that uh, well, there's just far smarter people on this call than I, so they can they can correct me where I'm wrong here. Um, one thing to provide in a distinction is, as you're saying, antivirus is what our classic thing. And we talk to a lot of people in which that in their base understanding is we have antivirus on the computer, thus covered. Um, and a lot of the advances in that space um, have evolved away from your classic basic, what we call dictionary checks, in which that you have an antivirus that reaches out, it gets an update that says these are known bad files, you get a file that's scanned and says, is this good or bad? Um, a lot of the newer next generation antiviruses are going to have different um, detection engines that are going to look either through behavioral things or different controls and access levels outside of just checking to say, is file good or bad? Um, a lot of the exploit attempts and ways that threat actors kind of navigate through your environment are outside of just the file being good or bad. Um, you know, we see Emotet, which is a banking Trojan that uh, skims through environments and it will exfiltrate data for banking and routing information and passwords and et cetera. It moves from macros, like that's a predominant way that it does. And there's a, plenty of other avenues there. Um, so having a higher level next generation antivirus or security solution is pivotal in that front. Um, EDR is endpoint detection and response. And what that is, is that um, in the most rudimentary way I can describe it is um, a solution that it has a playbook looking for certain things, and then it will then respond once it detects that. So it has a pattern, it sees X, and that's a threat, known threat type. And then it'll go back to its playbook and it's going to say, hey, what am I supposed to do when this happens? Because I've seen something out there. Um, and those items, they, they're they not mutually um, one product, that, but they tie together. Um, and some of those are going to be implemented through multiple solutions. Um, there are plenty of products out there that do all in one, um, but you will potentially see that solutions have to be covered through multiple different products out there. Um, so it's not just one and done in that space. 
Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Mark, Greg, anything to add on top of that? I do not think I'm one of the smarter ones on the call, but I do agree with everything <laughs> that he just said. <laughs> agree. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Well, let's let's move on to uh, data protection. Everyone is always scared, and I know a lot of this stuff that we are talking about has to do and overlaps that some. But I want to specifically talk about you know companies are always scared. We all are. I mean, should I get? And it tizzy if I write a paragraph and it accidentally gets deleted, you know, <laughs> let alone, you know, years and years of information and sensitive data. I would love everybody here to help everybody out with specific tools, best practices. Start at, start at somebody small. They have, a, you know, a proper Microsoft license and what comes with that. And then let's go to the next level of data protection and the backups that go. Um, Greg, we'll start with you this time. Okay. Well, um, uh, one of the important things about Microsoft 365 that um, people don't often consider is that the infrastructure is backed up to a fairly well, but your emails aren't. So if someone goes in and deletes an email, that's not going to get backed up. You can't go and then retrieve that. So if that level of backup is required, you do need another backup product to back up your mailbox to make sure you're capturing messages that the user themselves may delete. And so, yes, your your Microsoft Mail is good. Um, Exchange with 365 is good. It's sound. It's highly unlikely it's going to go down or data is going to be lost. But if someone deletes it, you can't do anything about that. So there's lots of products that you can bolt onto 365 that will back up the mailbox. And it extends to other products that, um, micro, that tie into Outlook um, and or the Microsoft ecosystem like OneDrive um, and SharePoint. Well, actually, you can use OneDrive as a backup product, but SharePoint um, is another one that is commonly backed up for the very same reason. Um, I, as you go up the stack, then we're talking about possibly production data re related to the product. You may need versions. You may need uh, the ability to roll back, things of that nature. You need a much more sophisticated pro um, uh, product that will allow you uh, to meet recovery time objectives, which is how long can the business be without the data? Um, that's, uh, um, you know, those tend to work, um, they're a little bit, uh, well, they're more complex. They can work, uh, more swiftly, but they're designed for, um, a, a broader scope of, uh, backup processes that go with the products. Me meaning not necessarily readily available at your fingertips, but they're there and safe like a vault. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah. I, yes, that is correct. Yep. Okay, cool. Chris, Mark, anything to add on top of that? Thank you, Greg. I mean, it somewhat ties into a little bit of what, well, not to try to repeat ourselves much here, but um, a little bit with the beginning when Chris was mentioning about just permission um, um, control, access control is really important because if the wrong people have access to data that shouldn't have access, that's a higher risk, right, of uh, data flight, uh, just something being exposed that's private or sensitive that doesn't need to be exposed to an employee, let alone if it gets out to somebody else outside of the company. Um, so that, that's really important, um, having, you know, different levels of network security as well to protect from outsiders versus just, in, you know, you have your inside employee role-based controls, but then you also have like, Hey, do you, do you just have your Comcast modem connected to, uh, your network? And that's considered what you might say your firewall. Oh, no, you want to have a, uh, at least a business grade firewall in place, which would not be your, your internet provider's modem. Uh, but having a next generation firewall uh, that at least puts in a better firewall on your network level to protect outsiders from easily getting into your network to then um, touch your data. Uh, so that is, you know, again, basics, but it's, it's, it's still surprising when we come across and see what's in place for companies that are multi-million dollar companies and the, the lack of uh, protections that they have. Controls, yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, to to kind of add to that point, um, if a firm hasn't been hit with a crypto locker type um, virus, that is exactly how they work: is they go after the backups so that you can't just restore when you're locked out of your environment. So geographically dispersed backups that allow you, you know, at the company level, that allow you to pull data from somewhere that is not intimate with your current environment, allows you to work around that. Um, again, one of the reasons that, you know, they ask, I forget the famous outlaw that said, why'd you rob the bank? And he said, well, that's the money is crypto 
<laughs> activity is this, these viruses are still happening. And that's because if they can lock you out of your backups and they can shut down your environment, you have no choice but to pay them or start all over. And in cases of like hospitals, you know, and large companies, that's just not an option. And so having that security philosophy or mindset around backups is, you know, the security uh, mindset that we talked about earlier around backups is, is very important because, um, that, you know, we're talking about early stages of, uh, of protection. And that is one of the more likely places to get hit before you realize it's needed. Now, do, do any of you all, or do all of you have some favorite tools so that, that you utilize in this area? I, I, to save everybody from going over to Yelp to find the best stuff, <laughs> you know, let, let's just let them know right now. What, what, what are some of the most, you know, secure backup solutions that y'all have seen work the best? So we, we use Veeam. Um, Veeam is one of the products we use um, for more environment type backups. Uh, we use Azure Backup for data that's in the cloud. There is, there's no shortage of backup products as well. It really comes down to what you're backing up, um, the expectation you have of the product. Some can be very rudimentary in their feature set. Some can be more robust and more complex. And so, you know, it's like, what kind of car are you going to buy? Yeah, those, right. all those options exist. So I, I think there's quite a few, um, you know, and the ones that aren't good tend not to stick around because <laughs> you are talking about a finite, a finite, uh, a finite point where, you know, their value is proven when you need to restore your data. So, um, uh, I, th I think there's no shortage of options out there that, uh, that stick around. I would, yeah, I would definitely say not to play hide the ball here when it comes to particular product sets, but, um, to Greg's point is that there is plenty out there. Um, and the most critical thing is really identifying your data, what needs to be backed up, having a game plan around that, because then from there, you're going to be able to choose exactly the right solution. Um, I think the, the, the most critical component of it to me is one. So we follow NIST when it comes to that framework is, um, is the three, two, one methodology, three copies of your data, two separate media types. And one of those has to be offsite. It's a great point. If you are getting hit and you're encrypted and your data is in that same environment, you have nothing to restore from, but being able to have that off in a different location and separated, that's critical. Um, and as well, having a product and having a game plan that ultimately testing your backups. Um, I think all of us can speak, we've, we've probably seen it far too often in which that businesses find out that their backups have failed or are not working. Um, when it comes to critical times, you know, I've, I've, uh, I have picked up, you know, in a business partner in which that unfortunately their previous provider had been providing him backup for four years and no one clicked start when they first mm. started doing the backups four years prior. Wow. Um, and then did they that really with, happened. Yeah, that didn't <laughs> happen. And they, uh, unfortunately happened to be in a space in which that they, the criticality of them retaining their data for records, um, it was paramount. Um, and so, you know, it, it, to me. In our, my business, what we always say is that, um, you know, if we lose your data, I mean, we'll, we'll fire ourselves, you know, because that's, it's so, it's so incredibly critical. Um, right. So you can't just have a product and then say it's good. Even if your product is, we plug in a thumb drive, we pull the data off and we take it home, you know, for those small businesses that are doing something at that base level, test it, make sure that it's good, make sure that you're covered, make sure you have a plan. Um, is more critical than anything else out there. It's more yep. critical than any product that you can slap a label on. Uh, yes, I would say. So, Chris, did you walk into that company and you push start and you said that'll be five thousand uh, dollars? No, 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 no. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was a situation where we, you know, um, we we couldn't pull them back from the brink. You know, it's kind of too far gone at that moment. But you know, the nice thing about us is we verify and test all of our backups, yep. just like everybody yep. else on this call. So they yep. never have to worry about that with us. <laughs> um, but. Mark, you, you know, you're going to say something there, bud? No, uh, I it just, it's, I think Greg alluded to it a little bit ago about, you know, you can, whatever the tool is on all these different areas of security, like they're just tools, but somebody has to manage it well, right? And they have to know how to manage it because, um, you know, sometimes it, they're sold a certain way, like, hey, it does everything, whether it's an EDR or it's a backup solution or any other type of security solution. Um, there's a human that has to actually know how to properly manage it, make sure it's still doing its job, 
or you still have risks like, oh, I just turned it on and I they said it works, like, but somebody has to make sure it's working more likely, probably a professional that actually understands those products and can manage them appropriately. Otherwise, again, like the backup sister, perfect example. Oh, well, we put it in place. Well, somebody didn't manage it well and right. look what happened. Um, right. You know. Right. Well, excellent. Well, you know, all, all of this talk, you know, it's a perfect segue to what I'd like to talk about next is, you know, when the you know what hits the fan, your incidents response, you know, what what ifs, you know, I think most, I forget the number, I, I think it's in the high 90 percentages, but it's human error is what causes most breaches. So it's obviously, or you know, they can literally accidentally delete a lot of backup files, right? So in y'all's experience, as well as looking forward and to give advice here, are, are there any key elements of an incident response plan that people should foc focus on when the proverbial, you know, what does, you know, like I said, hit the fan? I mean, y'all, I mean, it's almost good that you're silent. It means y'all don't have to deal with this a lot, but <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of stuff and I'm sure you would say, okay, well, I'm sure you've gone into places that have happened. What steps did you take to kind of start to untangle, help people out? And if they are being held hostage, we can quickly talk about that, but you're not going to like the answer. Um, but we'll, we will share our, at least I will share, you know, some stories that I've heard and how that works. But let's talk about like, you know, helping people out of a mess. Like I just lost everything. Like what, what can I potentially do right now? Okay, so if we're talking just being, you know, just realizing that there was an incident, probably the first, if you're working with a managed service provider, we would notify them. We would recommend notifying them. We would also recommend you calling your insurance company because in a lot of cases, the insurance company has teams that are specifically um, put together to explore cyber incidents um, and or negotiate with bad actors. Um, so... Your IT firm typically, or your MSP or your IT staff can help you identify maybe some particulars about what went down. Um, but really we're in the world of insurance because the IT firm's not gonna be paying out uh, the ransom, for example. Um, that typically comes down to an insurance claim. And so when the insurance company is involved, they wanna drive. They wanna make sure that everything's being done according to their specifications. Um, and that's when it kind of turns over to them. Now, there's all kinds of uh, incidents that could happen in terms of breaching. I just got locked out of my LinkedIn account. I had, I did not, I did not have 2FA in place. I got locked out of my LinkedIn account. I mean, that's the kind of thing I could call. I, I took care of it, but if that kind of thing, I, happened, I appreciate your honesty, CEO. Yes, I know. Evo, I know. Of an IT know. managed service provider. Based it's locked down practice. now. It's locked down now. <laughs> um, if you see my picture on your post, don't be surprised. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, but there's other kind of incidents that could happen where an IT firm would take it. But if you're in a situation where you're uh, ransoms being demanded, that is more than a technical issue. That becomes a, an insurance matter. On that, before you even got to the point of insurance, have cybersecurity insurance. Let's be, yes. let's start there, right? Yes. Um, right. A common. Uh, item that that's comes a great point. Talk. Thank you, Chris. I was thinking. Yeah. That Wait, that's it. not included in my business insurance. <laughs> it's not, and so that's a great question, Greg. Um, so with it though, and this happens a lot. Talking to a lot of businesses, they'll come and ask, "Well, don't I have these security protocols? I'm I'm good. I don't need it." Um, and at the end of the day, the answer is no. You need cybersecurity insurance. As Greg pointed out, your managed service provider, your IT service provider, they're going to have the tools to help and support in that process. But ultimately, the security team of the cybersecurity insurance is going to be running that operation if you're getting to that level. Um, and so uh, no matter your maturity, if you're the top tier up there uh, as a business, you need cybersecurity insurance. If you're just a small little firm, uh, trust me, you're still, an, you're a target, right? Just, oh, you hear it a lot. People go, well, I'm just a small company. No one wants my data. It doesn't matter. You know, you're, you're on the internet, you are a target and there's a cost to your operations. So cybersecurity insurance is critical for those exact reasons. So, Chris, yeah. thank you so much for bringing that up. And, and I think we all know, um, now this is bad news, good news, start with the bad news is insurance premiums with cyber, I'm hearing are going up like three and 400%, right? And becoming more and more difficult to attain. That too. 
Now, on that note, work with your uh, IT department, work with your IT managed service provider, have get what's needed by those insurance companies to see where you are because your premiums will come way, way down. Well, A, you'll be qualified straight up because yeah. you're not B, your premiums are going to come way down. So do not like have these things separate. That needs to be part of your IT department. Your IT managed service provider needs to get that list so they can go down that checklist and, and take care of everything to lower your premiums to make it affordable because it's getting expensive. But at the same time, I personally, and this is just me, uh, have talked to two people that had their uh, businesses saved because they had cyber insurance. They got locked out and they had to negotiate a ransom. And it's, it's just like the movies too, really, from their stories that they told me as they negotiate with the terrorists or whatever and, and they make a deal with them. And, you know, they actually honor, they send the information back once they get their money, you know, it's just, it, it really works the way you think it works. But you don't got that insurance. You don't got those chunks of money. To, yeah, that's what you pay it for. I mean, everybody has insurance with car, home. Do it for your business. And right now in business these days is cyber insurance. So sorry, get off my high horse there, but it's it's a big deal. that I think people just overlook like way too yeah. often. Yeah, yeah. way too I'll, often. I'll, I'll, I'll also add that um, you will be treated more favorably if you are submitting your security position to the insurance company as opposed to them requesting you to fill something out on their form because you are already you've already identified to the insurance company that you take security seriously and here's, here are the things that you have in place in your environment that is a much different position than someone that goes to, for a policy and says what am i eligible for and they say we'll fill out this form um by taking the initiative to know the security posture of your organization, you are sending a signal to the insurance company that that is top of mind for you, and and that bodes well um, in the rates that you'll be able, that you'll be granted. Excellent, excellent. Anyone else have any um, any parting thoughts there? And then we'll just get to our uh, last topic here. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's not a fun topic for a lot of people, right? It's, you know, more money to be spent, especially if they're not having it, so they the, the don't have the coverage. Because uh, the other thing is, like, the, if I have a comprehensive policy, which I'm not an insurance agent by any means, but, you know, there's other things to consider, like business interruption. If you have the right policy, that's going to also cover, cover, like, hey, if there's, I think the recent uh, number that I heard is 14 to 16 days of business interruption. If you have a ransomware attack specifically, um, can you afford to be down for 14 to 16 days while the insurance company is doing all the, or, or maybe they don't have insurance and you're worried about your IT provider or some other third party that's trying to help, you know, mitigate the situation? Can you afford to be down for two weeks um, with your operations possibly halted? IT might be able to restore backups and do a few things that get you going, but it's still going to cause a major disruption. So the policy also covers that. And some policies even cover reputation. Um, you know, how's this going to, is there a big breach? Did a bunch of sensitive data get touched? You know, can you recover from your reputation being tarnished um, and having some help from the insurance uh, cover those um, issues as well? So it's, 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 I think it's education, you know, it's, where we lack in our industry at times. Um, we're so quick to just say, hey, here's here's the nuts and bolts of what I do, but not really educating the why, which is obviously why we're having this conversation. But um, as we continue to educate better, I think people will, will say, okay, that makes sense because somebody really did explain it to me versus I'm just trying to sell you this product to, you know, make a buck, right? Yeah, no one likes insurance. Yeah. <laughs> no. Because <laughs> we hardly, you know, if we're lucky, we never use it, you know? Oh, well, it'll never happen. Like, it'll never right. happen to me. It'll never happen to me. It'll never happen to me. But it happens to lots of people. So, yeah. you know. If it wasn't necessary, then and the insurance companies wouldn't be out there, right? right. You know, they, they play a critical role. And, and it so, wouldn't be a booming industry yeah, <laughs> either. So. I don't like, I don't like that it is, but it is what it is, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, it is. I guess when, you know, beginning of times, people started dying. You're like, well, wait a second. We got to we gotta do something about this, right? Now we are in <laughs> cyber, cyber security. Now, to, to kind of just tie things up here, just real quick. And again, y'all may or may not have your go-to. But to help, you know, point people 
to stay on top of emerging threats and where they can be informed of the latest cybersecurity threats and trends, any proactive you know, measures that people can stay on the education level. Do any of you have any go-tos that you, you, you constantly are looking at or reading or watching that other people can kind of join in on? So I would recommend, so the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, so CISA, so that's federal agency um, overseeing cybersecurity. Um, they have a lot of great resources. Um, and if you're not going to go out to their website, you can actually subscribe for alert feeds and they'll send you emails about emerging threats that are happening. Some of it's a high level technical, but they will touch base and say, hey, we're seeing an active threat in this particular industry, this this piece of software, um, these items, they will point those out. Um, and so those you get regular emails on that. I would encourage that. Yeah, I agree. Excellent. Yeah, that's one I would recommend as well. All right. Awesome. Mark, any, anything to add there or is that what you also keep in tune yeah, with? For the non-technical person, yeah, I mean, that's the saying. I mean, I personally, um, there's just a lot of different people I follow on LinkedIn if you're in the social media. So a lot of, there's a lot of folks in um, the cybersecurity world that they don't talk over your head, but um, they provide a lot of good information if you like to read off of social media. And it's easy to just start researching and finding people quickly to follow. Um, but outside of that, yeah, there's there's just, Google is a great resource. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have any particulars on LinkedIn that we can give a shout out to that's really? Shilling IT. Yeah, Shilling IT. <laughs> Shilling IT. Um, you know, I think one one person that probably would, people would, um, could re listen to and read easily is a Wes Spencer. He's very good with communication. Um, in regards to talking about cybersecurity a lot, where he makes it very relatable for people can understand versus getting very technical. Okay. Um, he would definitely be one resource I would recommend. Okay, well, excellent. Awesome. Well, you all, um, I really uh, appreciate everybody's time. I, I know, you know, listeners are going to get, you know, a lot out of this, and that was the intention of today. So I appreciate all of you for your time. I know you're very busy. Uh, but everyone out there, uh, again, we got Greg Bebo, Chris Olson, and Mark Schilling. If anybody's in their areas, uh, definitely give each one of them a call and uh, we can help execute some of the stuff that we talked about today. But thank you very much and uh, we'll see you on the next one.